What's up, everybody? And today we are reacting to the American Revolution by Oversimplified. Uh, I get requested Oversimplified a lot, so I thought I'd do the American Revolution because I am a British citizen now living in America, and now I also have my American citizenship. So um, it'll be interesting to see because I don't really know much about this, if I'm honest with you, at all. Um, so I am interested to know a little bit about the history of the country I now live in and the country that I now love really and the one that's adopted me so without further ado let me just pull this up Boop. and let's get reacting to it shall we i'll leave a link down below to the og video make sure you go over there give it a good old like and all that good stuff here we go holy smokes christopher columbus that is no way to address the king and queen of spain what is wrong <laughs> with you okay okay so you know how we're looking for a new trade route to india right right and the earth is round right right so i'm thinking we can just sail the other way around the planet right yeah so i set sail right mm -hmm. and i reach india right right wrong wrong i did <laughs> not reach india i did not all right no all right get to the point did you know there's a whole nother freaking continent out there Okay, and you think I should care about this? Why? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I forget to mention there's gold everywhere? Gold? <laughs> ah! Columbus landed in... Can I just say, didn't, isn't there a rumor that the Vikings actually landed in North America before Columbus? And that Columbus actually didn't land in North America. He landed in Puerto Rico or something like that. Right? Am I talking shit? Let's have a look. In Central America in October 1492, and he had the time of his life. And by that I mean he went on a huge theft and murder spree. He stole yeah. gold, jewelry, people, and a hammock. And then he returned to show off all of his riches, including a few previously undiscovered items, such as tobacco, the pineapple, turkeys, and a hammock. Now I know what you're thinking, but oversimplified, <laughs> Columbus didn't discover America, the Vikings did. What? And you'd be partially right. In the 11th century, Leif Erikson was the first European to land in America. But hey, if you love Vikings so much, then why don't you check out today's sponsor, Vikings? I'll fast forward it through this, which is kind of interesting that the Vikings, I've heard that this is kind of like a bit of a rumor and it's not 100% confirmed. Um, but I'd like to know more about that. If you know more about that, let me know in the comments, Under okay? Nickname oversimplified. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Columbus, time of his life, hammock. And suddenly the race was on to explore and conquer the new world. After yeah. a couple centuries of warring with the natives and each other, the European powers had claimed quite a lot of land, including yeah. this area, which both the English and the French claimed as theirs. One day the French said, I'm going to build some forts along here. And the English were like, could you not? And the French said, sorry, but no, I could not not. And they went ahead and built their <laughs> forts, which pissed off the English. So they sent an up and coming British lieutenant colonel by the name of George Washington with a combined force of British troops and Native Americans. After a short battle, the French commander said, all right, all right, we surrender. Okay, boys, pack it up. They're surrendering. Oh, sorry. Was I not meant to split his head open with a tomahawk? Ah, don't worry. It's not like this will start a seven-year-long major global conflict. And what happened next was a seven-year-long major global conflict. Which <laughs> this guy's hilarious, isn't it? Like, he's genuinely hilarious. Great Britain won. At the peace negotiations, Spain gave up Florida, while France gave up all of its territories in North America. Yeah. But Britain's victory came at a cost. A 60 million pound cost. Oh, they were now broke, boy. in a lot of debt, and had to come up with some way to repay it. So they yeah. went to the colonies and said, okay, listen up. So a huge part of the war was spent protecting you from the French, and now we have no money because of it. So... Tax. I'm not sure what you're saying here. Okay, so we spent a lot of money protecting you from the French, right? right. Yeah. And now we're broke. That certainly is a pickle. Listen to me. We spent all of our money protecting you, and now we need money. <laughs> Can you please pay us back some money? Yikes. No. Okay, we're just going to go ahead and tax you. In yeah, I was going to say, tax... Oh, such a pain in the ass. 64, Britain introduced the Sugar Act, forcing the colonists to import sugar and molasses exclusively from the British and to pay duties on them. Then a year mm. later, they introduced the extremely controversial Stamp Act, and it worked a little something like this. Hello, shopkeep. Hello... This is the thing, like, I actually don't know much about why it all kicked off in the first place. All I know is that it was about tax and that America drunk, dunked a bunch of tea in the water, which is blasphemy. I'm still kind of bitter about that. Tea is fantastic. You don't throw it in the sea, guys. There could have been other ways to start the war, apart from ruining some good tea. Hello, oh, Mr. Bungleberry. Here's the deed for your new shack. Stamp. That'll be three pence, please. Wait, what was that? It's the new tax. I get a stamp on any paper or documentation I make, and you have to pay for it. Would you like to see this pamphlet that explains everything? Yes, please. Okay. Stamp. What? Two pence, please. This is awful. You know what? Just give me a deck of cards so I can go gamble my pain away. Okay. No. <laughs> Don't do it. Stamp. 
Obviously, the colonists were like, <laughs> hey, my dudes, this new tax legislation right here, this is BS. Until now, yeah. they had enjoyed relative freedom to rule themselves, and yeah. suddenly Britain was asserting its control. They were especially... Which isn't fair. It isn't fair. And the fact that, I mean, British, Brit the British did it, but also French did it, Spain did it, Spanish did it. Just going and taking over the world, not very good idea. Nor is it very nice. Why can't we just be happy and content with what we've got? I guess it's the greed, the natural greed that uh, is inside all humans, right? Especially unhappy because they didn't have any representatives in the parliament that was levying taxes mm. on them, so they protested. Yep. Orators gave fiery speeches. British goods were boycotted, and anyone loyal to the British found themselves increasingly harassed. The yep. whole thing actually began to take quite a toll on British business, and after just a couple years, the British were forced to repeal the Stamp Act. But we still desperately need money. What should we do? We could try taxing the colonies. Great idea. Oh, Wait, geez. didn't we literally just try that and it failed miserably? Man, look at me. I look fabulous. Have you ever seen <laughs> such a handsome boy? No sorry, Georgie. No way. You're the handsomest, smartest, most popular king that ever lived, and everybody likes you. You're doing such a good job. Uh, your majesty? Oh, you're still here. <laughs> Get the hell out. So in 1766, yeah. the British made a declaration saying, we can do what we want because we're in charge and you can all go suck it. The, <sighs> the British asserting dominance for no reason whatsoever, apart from their own benefit, which most people did back then, which really sucks. They levied a whole bunch of new taxes on the Americans via import duties. Glass? There's a tax for that. Lead? Mm. There's a tax for that. Paper? Tea? Oil? There's a tax for that. <laughs> and once again, the Americans boycotted British goods, British business felt the pinch, and the yep. British had to back down. All right, this is ridiculous. They're my yep. colonies, and I have to be able to assert my control. Repeal all the new taxes except for the one on tea. Also send 1,000 troops to Boston to take control. Oh, and make the colonists pay for them. And as British troops... So everything but tea was taxed? Sorry, no, everything wasn't taxed but tea. That's very strange. That is very strange. Since arrived, the tension in Boston was palpable. You could cut it with a knife, and it was all about to come to a head. On March 5th, a band of local patriots began heckling a British guard at the Customs House. More and more Americans joined in the heckling, while more British troops turned up in support of their comrade. Snowballs mm. were thrown at the British. The snowballs turned to rocks, the rocks to oyster shells. The soldiers... Why oyster shells? Like, why was it oyster shells? Outnumbered, panicked, one thing leads to another, and you can see where this is going. Yeah. Five civilians were killed. The Patriot press throughout the colonies declared the Boston Massacre an unwarranted crime committed against the people of Boston by the cruel British. Yeah. The anger continued to grow. A British revenue schooner that ran aground in Rhode Island was burned by the locals. When it came to light that the governor of Massachusetts supported the suppression of the colonists, <laughs> his house was burned by the locals. And next, the colonists would set their sights on the remaining tax on tea. I mean, I don't blame them. I don't blame them at all. Like, as someone who served in the British military, right? If I lived and grew up in a country and it just so happened to be, you know, originally English that came over, right? But then they start coming over, taxing the crap out of us for their own good and we're seeing no benefit at all. And they just start asserting a dominance. I can see why people get angry. Like, that makes sense, right? On December 16th, 1773, a band of patriots known as the Sons of Liberty disguised themselves as Native Americans, marched down to Boston Harbor, boarded a British merchant ship loaded with tea, and in front of thousands of spectators, threw nearly 10,000 pounds worth of tea overboard. <sighs> that poor tea. I bet the sea tasted great. The British <laughs> were disgusted, and they punished Massachusetts <laughs> with a vengeance. They dissolved... <laughs> what it had to it's so stereotypical for brits to get so upset about tea i don't even drink tea anymore i, I drink like tea every now and again but it's more green tea than anything i don't really my mom and dad drink tea like it's on on a drip like all day <laughs> Baltic's general assembly revoked their charter and sent 3,000 more troops to occupy Ooh. the city meaning boston and massachusetts were now essentially under the direct rule of great Britain. yeah and oh boy, were the people pissed. The yeah, other bet. colonies saw what was happening and worried they might be next. Yep. So they called a brain trust to decide what to do. 56 delegates from 12 colonies gathered and met in Philadelphia at the First Continental Congress. And the roll call read like a who's who of America's finest thinkers. I'm Isn't that absolutely like, it gives me goosebumps to think that, that people got together. At this point, there was like, in, in the US is a big divide, right? We all know that between the two, dif two different major political parties. And it sucks. But at one period of time, everyone banded together and was like, we want to be America and left alone. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. 
talking lawyers extraordinaire Johnny A and Johnny J, experienced military commander George Washington, businessman and future alcoholic beverage Samuel Adams, fiery orator Patty H, <laughs> guy who married a rich lady Big J Dickinson. And while they weren't present at the first Congress, soon names like James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and much later Alexander Hamilton would all serve time in the Continental Congress. The question now, though, was what to do about the British. After much bitter debate and disagreement, they definitely should have used Lynn Man Miranda's head as uh, Hamilton then. <laughs> they eventually agreed on an amazing solution. They would simply ask the British to stop. Can yeah. you stop? No. It didn't work. Okay, then okay. tell the local militias to start arming and be ready at a minute's notice. Yep. And across the colonies, these Minutemen stood ready for the beginning of the American Revolutionary... Oh, so that's what the Minutemen were. Okay, because I've heard that before. War. Now, having your colonies in open rebellion is one thing. Once they start arming themselves, that's when it really hits the fan. So British General yep. Thomas Gage ordered 700 troops from Boston out into the rebel-controlled Massachusetts countryside to destroy stores of arms and ammunition held by the rebels in Concord. The British set out in the middle of the night. Patriots, including Paul Revere, rode ahead to warn that the British were coming, giving the rebels... That's the whole, the British are coming, the British, okay. The two sides met in Lexington as the sun began to rise. They faced off against each other, and in the confusion, somebody shot first. The shot heard around the world marked the beginning of the American War of Independence. Wow. The rebels were outnumbered and had to fall back to Concord as the British split up to search for rebel supplies. However, wow. more and more Patriot rebels kept showing up. And this time, it was the British who were outnumbered as more fighting kicked off in Concord. The most professional army in the world was forced to flee back to Boston at the hands of local, poorly trained militiamen. Wow. And all along the British were back to Boston, Patriot rebels continued to gather and open fire on the retreating British. So these untrained fighters for america i wonder what their fighting was actually like i'm sure they weren't using tactics like the british because you can very easily dominate a very organized military by using guerrilla tactics we know that it happened in afghan for a long time right they would just use guerrilla tactics and it held us back for years for years so that's very plausible but i'm wondering what that like i want to go deep into the tap i want to know what they actually did like how did they force like because they obviously didn't have the training they had the weapons but they didn't have the training so how did they force back such a well-trained army was it literally just guerrilla tactics and ambushes and and kind of playing dirty in a way which is i know it's playing dirty seen as a bad thing but when you're in a position like the Minutemen were it's the only thing you can really do in it and it worked so you know, if it works, is it really bad? When the British reached Boston, the rebel militias surrounded them. Yep. Boston and the British were now under siege as small land and naval skirmishes continued around wow. the city. And the British would suffer another embarrassing blow, this time in upstate New York. Colonel Benedict Arnold concocted a plan to take the British stronghold Fort Ticonderoga, which held a large amount of guns and ammunition. He set off towards the fort alone, hoping to recruit men along the way when he came across the Green Mountain Boys, led by Ethan Allen, who, as it turned out, had the exact same plan he did. So they decided to work together. But I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm in oh, charge. Geez. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. Egos. Egos as always, this right? This went on for some time, until the Green Mountain Boys threatened to go home, and Arnold had to concede. The group raided the fort at night while the Redcoats were asleep, and they caught them completely <laughs> by surprise, taking the fort and all of its munitions with almost no resistance. Wow. wow. Good job, Ethan. Very impressive. By the way, what happened to that other guy we sent to take the fort? Who? Benedict Arnold. Never heard of him. Ouch. <laughs> what? The... But nobody knew what was going on. Yeah. The colonies were in open rebellion, and for now, they even seemed to be winning. So yeah. King George fired General Gage, replaced him with General William Howe, and ordered the rebellion to be put down immediately. Okay, the British are definitely going to retaliate for all yeah. of this, so we should probably put together a proper army. First, we need to pick a commander-in-chief, and I think we can all agree that that job should go to the man, the myth, the legend, George Washington. My friends, I am humbled and honored that you would consider me for such an important role. I did not expect for this. All right, you've been showing up in a military uniform every day for the last <laughs> 10 months. We all know you wanted this, so cut the crap, George. Dude. <laughs> Cool. So Washington began his journey up to Boston to take command of the newly established Continental Army. Ju how many, I wonder how many British soldiers we actually had all together at the time and how many um, Americans were fighting at the time. I wonder what the numbers actually were because at the end of the day, America hadn't been around for that long, so could they have recruited that many people? Could they have popula pop could they have populated the area that quickly, you know? And at the same time, Britain's not that big. So I wonder what the 
what the Gustav's contrast the was. Made their first major attempt to break the siege. They made plans to take the high ground on Bunker Hill, but spies warned the Continentals of the British plans, so they fortified Bunker Hill and set up defensive positions on nearby Breed's Hill. The day of the battle came, and as the British advanced, a barrage of Continental gunfire was opened up on them. Twice they tried to climb the hill, twice they were pushed back. Damn. The battle lasted three hours until the Continentals finally ran out of ammunition and had to retreat, allowing the British to take the hill. While yep. technically a British victory, they suffered nearly 1,000 casualties to the Continentals 400. The colonists Ooh. showed the British that this wasn't just a rebellion, it was war, and yeah. they were ready for it. But one thing they weren't <laughs> sure about was why they were fighting. While some radicals were starting to throw around the I-word, most hoped to eventually repair their relationship with Great Britain. So they didn't actually want independence, they just wanted to be left alone at first. They just wanted to be left alone. That makes sense. So they sent a letter to King George saying, Hey man, looks like things aren't going your way. Yeah. Remove the taxes and let's be friends. I'm gonna kick your ass. Ego. Why is it always people with... Why is it always guys with egos? Like, why? Why? Why can't we just be content and be happy with what we've got? What is... I mean, we're getting into philosophy here, aren't we? But what is it that really drives all these people to do stupid things like these. It's so annoying. Colonies, your majesty, your handwriting is terrible. Are you <laughs> sure? Just do it. What does it say? He's gonna lick my... <laughs> Gross. So for the remainder of the year, small engagements continued to occur around the colonies. The British burned down the towns of Falmouth, Massachusetts, and Norfolk, Virginia as revenge for earlier anti-British incidents. These mm. actions played right into the hands of Patriot propaganda. Overseas, the British were seen as brutes, and the French and Spanish would soon begin sending supplies to the rebel cause. During this yeah. time, there was also... Why not, right? Because Spain, France, and Brits were the big three, weren't they, at the time? So why wouldn't France and Spain be like, hey, let's try and help them out and try and weaken English or the English a bit. They're fighting going on between Patriot and Loyalist militias in the southern colonies. Benedict Arnold was still on a mission to win some personal glory for himself, so he headed up an attempt to invade Canada in a two-pronged attack. The Continentals managed to capture some British forts and the city of Montreal, but a harsh snowstorm with some smallpox on the side saw them defeated and pushed back at Quebec City. And they were forced to retreat all the way to Fort Ticonderoga. Speaking of which, remember all those guns and ammunition? Well, this guy's got a plan for what to do with them. He uses oxen <laughs> to drag 120,000 pounds of artillery for two wow. weeks through the harsh winter, 300 miles all the way to Washington and his Continental Army surrounding Boston. Boom. Washington's got himself some big guns. Which wow. is fortunate, because up until now, his army had been suffering through the cold winter, not knowing when the siege would end. Now... Yeah, fighting in the winter, not so... Here, I live in Maine right now. The winters here are horrific. And they're the same pretty much all in, in, in the, all of New England. So I couldn't imagine fighting a war in, them weather, in that weather. Like, that's disgusting. They could make a move. Washington wanted to launch a full assault on the city, but his junior officers felt the British were too fortified. And to his credit, Washington was great at hearing and taking on board the ideas of others. Instead, the Continentals worked through the night, setting the guns up on Dorchester Heights, overlooking the city. And when mm. dawn broke and the British saw the guns, they knew they were toast. Their positions were completely exposed. It was yep. checkmate. They had no choice but to abandon the city. 120 ships carried 9,000 redcoats and 2,000 wow. rebels away to an unknown fate. And Washington had his first victory of the war. Washington wow. then moved his army to New York, knowing that when the British returned, they would probably land there. In the meantime, a friendly looking old man by the name of Thomas Paine had written and published a pamphlet called Common Sense, in which he advocated for total <laughs> independence from Great Britain. It so this is the this is the first little bit of we want full independence. That's crazy. That's crazy. Spread across the colonies like wildfire, and to this yep. day remains the best-selling title in America. It was read aloud in taverns and meeting halls, and brought wow. the idea of independence into the mainstream. Congress began to seriously consider the idea. Thomas Jefferson was selected to write up an official Declaration of Independence, and he went hard, writing that all men are created equal with certain inalienable rights, including yep. life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yep. Of course, Jefferson had over a hundred slaves, but we don't have to talk about that. On the 2nd of July, Congress voted unanimously in favor of independence, and John Adams declared that the 2nd of July would go down as the most remembered day in American history. Then a couple days later, independence actually came into effect. <laughs> the United States of America... <laughs> That's amazing. Holy cow. Uh, holy born. cow. There was no turning back now. The Americans tore down a statue of King George in New York and melted yeah. it down into 42,000 musket balls. To the British, it was treason. And it That's amazing. They actually put them into musket balls. Probably to fight the British. That's amazing. If the king had his way, Washington and all of Congress would be hung. Speaking of the British, guess who's back? The king sent an intimidating force of 130 warships and 25,000 men to New York. Wow. Washington knew that taking on the most powerful military in the world wouldn't be easy. The British set up camp on Staten Island as the Americans dug into defensive positions around Brooklyn Heights, waiting yep. for an attack to come. But the British just 
waited, wearing down their opponent's nerve while building their own strength. At one point, they launched a big scary artillery barrage and then said, you know, if I was you right now, I'd probably sue for peace. But Washington told them to shove it. The Americans kept holding up for what was coming, and when they finally hit, they hit hard. 15,000 British troops approached the American position, and the two sides fired on each other in massive rows. But what the Americans didn't realize was they were only fighting a decoy. The main British force was going around to flank the Americans from Cheeky behind, flank. and when they arrived, they inflicted heavy casualties. The yep. Americans panicked and retreated back to Brooklyn Heights, where they yep. then found themselves trapped between the British army and the river. It looked as though the war was already lost, but luckily, instead of attacking, the British decided to dig in for a siege, and then a thick fog set in, allowing Washington's army to escape across the river unimpeded. The so literally just because the fog set in, they were able to get away. Isn't that amazing? Like, I love hearing history like this. I think it's such a... It's so kind of evil. It's evil, right? From the ego of men. But also poetic in the um, kind of determination of the common man. Who wants happiness for everyone, right? The people who aren't just driven by ego. They're just driven by hope and their need to live a peaceful life. It's crazy. The British continued to chase and engage the Americans up Manhattan, and the Americans suffered defeat after defeat after defeat. It was a disaster. Washington's leadership was called into question, as thousands of American POWs were left to rot as traitors. Wow. Washington's army fled through New Jersey all the way down to Pennsylvania. Wow. Really had an army been so badly beaten yet survived to fight another day. Wow. All right, guys, if you want to watch part two, I will do it if you like and comment this video. If it gets enough likes and comments, I'll do part two. If not, I'll probably just watch it my own time because I think this stuff is fascinating. I truly do. I think it's super interesting because if anything, I love this country I'm in right now. I love America, right? I'm an American citizen now. And although I grew up and raised in Manchester, England, and I'm proud to be a Brit and I'm proud to be from Manchester, very proud. Um, the history of my country is not very good. It's true. It's true. And you could say at the same time that America is writing a bad history for themselves at the moment with different wars that are endless and make no sense. Um, but I've been adopted into this country with open arms, so I can't help but love it and appreciate the good history of this country, um, even if there is bad history in both countries, you know. And there's some good history in, in Britain as well. There is some good parts especially in manchester there's some incredible parts of manchester that has has some really good history so you know there's goods and there's bads but i'm proud to be a brit and i'm proud to be an american and i'm proud to be living over here and if anything this puts me very close to what the original um patriots were which were just immigrants from europe i am one of them i am literally the same right and would i if i if i had an american wife which i do now and kids back then and the british were coming over and they were trying to tell me what to do and what my family what to do would i have reacted the same way who knows probably probably right who knows who knows it's a crazy thing to think about um and it's hard to think about unless you're put into a situation like that when your family's in danger you'll do anything to protect your family it doesn't matter what country you're from or what country you live in your family's first right but I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments down below. Let me know what you think. Um, are you American? Are you British? What do you think If, if and, and from either side? Um, and do you want me to watch part two? Let me know in the comments down below. But for now, members, you're beautiful. You're amazing. I love you. I couldn't do this without you. I honestly couldn't make videos every single day if it wasn't for these beautiful members. So thank you for supporting the channel as much as you do. I truly, truly, truly appreciate it. I really do. Links down below to all my socials, including the two different YouTube channels, Original Human Geek, where we play D&D &D and Original Adventures, where you can see the vlogs of me and my wife converting a school bus to travel the United States and visit the beautiful places of this country and see some incredible history. Um, but other than that, I'll see you in the next video. I love you all. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.